Cari amici, siamo a Parma, non posso togliere la mascherina perché siamo all'aperto ed è obbligatoria solo quando ci sono molte persone, ma quello che conta è quello che vi farò vedere, non la mia faccia, per cui eh, il nostro giro sta per iniziare. Eh, come sapete, as you know, Parma is a city that I love very much. This is where I came to college, this have uh, many good friends, great memories. So it's going to be a very subjective tour, I'm not necessarily showing you the best of Parma and it's a tour that I'm planning to go through for about half an hour, no more than that. So it's going to be pleasant, the weather is perfect, uh, it's just a beautiful late summer day, uh, pleasant light breeze, like perfect for a stroll and so I hope you will stay with me and in the meantime I'm going to try to use this thing that should help not making you feel nauseous. Okay, here we are. We are in the street that goes from the train station to the center. So ideally, if you arrive with the train, this is the street you would go through to reach the center that is very close by. Parma is a relatively small town. It's not even 200,000 people, but it's uh, one of the richest cities in Italy. The per capita income is one of the highest in the country. And it's also one of the cities that is uh, constantly listed on top of the cities with the best quality of life. And as you know, quality of life is measured according to different parameters. And income is not the only one, obviously, but there is the number of libraries, number of theaters, number uh, of services of different kinds uh, to the people. So we encounter our first church, is the Church of the Most Holy Trinity. And here it is. It's a beautiful white marble facade. As in all Italian cities, you have many of those churches. We are now reaching the main square of Parma. Um, and that's the first place I really want to show you. It's the place of the cathedral, as it very often happens in Italy. But before getting there, we're going to go through a very wide open space that is also a piazza, but of a different kind. And it's called Piazza della Pilotta. And I'm starting to talk about it. I'm starting to talk about it because in the meantime, I have to show you the place where I buy my shirts. They're made to measure and I'm not showing you the name so I'm not advertising and here we are Piazza della Pilotta or takes its name from uh, Pelota it's Pelota is the Spanish name for ball because it was a square that for a long time was at the center of these majestic massive complex of buildings uh, inside which there were piazze d'armi or squares that were big enough to have ball games of some sort and you see it here now it has been brought back to its original splendor with this beautiful uh, manicured grass that you see and there you go the sun is against us so probably the view is not the best you can have, but still, you have a sense of the magnitude. And back there, you see the building, there you go. That's a sort of a secular altar. It's a secular altar that, uh, that was erected to celebrate the annexation of Parma to the Kingdom of Italy uh, during the Risorgimento. And of course, Parma, all of you know, it's the city that uh, was the hometown to Giuseppe Verdi, even if he was born in a nearby town here, Busseto. But the name of Parma, of course, is identified uh, always with Verdi. He's the genius loci, the most important uh, citizen of, of Parma. And here, talking, uh, I just want to mention that in the Piazza della Pilotta, in that massive complex of buildings that you see there. 
there are uh, some very, very important museums. There is the Galleria Nazionale, that's the major museum in Parma, with some of the most uh, splendid paintings by Parmigianino, Correggio, uh, but also Titian, Tiepolo, and many others. Uh, there is the Archaeological Museum, but the most remarkable thing in there is the Teatro Farnese. Of course, in, in our walking tour, we are not going inside any building, uh, but the Teatro Farnese, you can easily uh, look it up, is the uh, wooden theater built at the beginning of the 17th century, in 1618, I believe, by Ranuccio Farnese to celebrate the visit of Cosimo II, the Medici Grand Duke of Tuscany to Parma. And it was one of these theaters that was supposed to be uh, built just to celebrate a big occasion. And it, there was a wedding, of course, because that was the reason why the Grand Duke was coming to Parma. And the theater was almost completely destroyed during World War II by Allied bombers. And it was rebuilt um, entirely. And now it can be used again. And actually the Festival Verde that is about to start also employs some, um, for some of the performances, the magnificent Teatro Farnese is considered one of the most important examples of uh, uh, Baroque architecture and not only in Parma. And here we have, we talked about Verdi as being the Nume Tutelare of Parma, but there you see a contemporary monument. It's now hidden by the uh, pine tree, but right behind it, we'll see it very shortly. There you go. Right there, you see half hidden by the pine tree. There is the, that's the monument to the partisan, to the anti-fascist freedom fighters that uh, were the heroes of World War II. Uh, Parma has traditionally always been a very left-wing city. The Oltre Torrente, the part of the city behind the Torrente, opposed a fierce resistance to the fascists and the Nazis. And this monument that uh, many people associate actually to uh, Michelangelo's David in terms of the resemblance of the, of the Partigiano with the David in Florence, and also the pose resting with one foot forward uh, uh, after the victory. So that's another very important monument in Parma, the monument to uh, Il Partigiano. And on the opposite side, we have a museum dedicated to another very important figure in Parma, the Duchess Maria Luigia. Maria Luigia had a great story uh, she was the daughter of the Austrian Emperor and she ended up marrying Napoleon. She was Napoleon's second wife. After the defeat of Napoleon during the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the crowned heads of Europe had to decide what to do with her. Uh, because yes, she was the wife of Napoleon and they got rid of all the, the relatives of Napoleon that he put on all the thrones of Europe. But they couldn't do the same thing with Napoleon's wife because she was indeed the daughter of the Austrian Emperor and therefore of one of the winners of Napoleon. Think about their uh, Christmas dinners, if they ever had them together. And uh, so they decided to create a sort of a toy state for these ladies, for Maria Luigia. And the toy state was the Duchy of Parma, Piacenza and Guastalla. And the capital of that uh, toy state was Parma. And Maria Luigia, who grew up in the two most important capitals of Europe at that time, being uh, Vienna and Paris, wanted to make of Parma a capital, even if it was the capital only of what I call a toy state. And she's still now very beloved in Parma. So Verdi, Maria Luigia, are the Jenny Loci, um, everything. Here talks about Maria Luigia, and this is probably for the city of Parma the most important legacy that the Duchess left. This is the Teatro Regio. Uh, as you know, it's one of the most important uh, opera theaters in the entire world, and it's actually one of the big nightmares of singers because the audience here is inflexible, and people are normally very 
well educated when it comes to music and they recognize a good performance when they hear one but they're also very critical when they hear something that is not quite up to their expectations um, I mentioned that um, one of the things that is going to happen right now is the Festival Verdi and you see that in front of the theater of the Teatro Regio again built in the neoclassical style uh, under the rule of Maria Luigia d'Austria and then di Francia um, you see that there are the already the signs for the upcoming Festival Verdi is a Gala Verdiana of course it's a reduced version of the Festival Verdi because uh, because of the anti-covid measures but they decided to start and to do something and here you see uh, they're gonna have an Ernani in a concert form in the park so it's not gonna be inside the theater and many many more initiatives and you can go online and look for the for what goes on in the Teatro Verdi uh, in the Teatro Regio and uh, you see Parma Dintorni and it's Festival Verdi dot it if you want to uh, check it out okay we continue now our tour of Parma across the street you see it's everything is around here so right there, the museum, the museum is called Museo Glauco Lombardi, the one with all the memorabilia of Napoleon's wife, Maria Luigia d'Austria. Here you see her in one of these uh, totems. Maria Luigia d'Austria, Duchessa di Parma, 1791-1847. And right there, there is the museum that has uh, some of her dresses, including her coronation dress, um, but also her embroidery set her fishing set, uh, many letters uh, that she wrote to Napoleon, uh, to her own father, the emperor, uh, to her son, uh, the Roi de Rome, or as he was called, uh, nicknamed by Napoleon, the Eglo, uh, L'Aquilotto, you know, tempting things in the cafes of Parma. And I'm walking sort of fast. See, there is the Torta Duchessa di Parma. There you go. Talking about uh, the constant presence of Maria Luigia. So I'm, I'm walking quite fast now from the Teatro Regio and it's just a little side street. And you probably see already in the background um, what I'm going to show you. Uh, the visit, historically, if we wanted to go uh, historically rather than topographically from the train station to the center, should have started here in front of the magnificent complex of buildings that you see ahead of you. Um, we are passing by now some of the uh, most elegant streets in the city. There you go. This is Via Cavour. It's sort of a shopping street with very elegant stores. And there you go. So I was telling you that we are heading towards the religious center of the city. There is Piazza del Duomo, as it very often, it's a very common name. And here again, you see some of the uh, prints that are for sale in the store. And of course, there are lots of Verdi portraits. And then there are reproduction of the most important uh, painters, of paintings by the most important painters in Parma, uh, Correggio and Parmigianino. There is a map of the city. As you see, the city is divided in two by uh, uh, not a river but by a torrente, uh, il Torrente Parma. It has the same name uh, as the city. And here you see some views of the 
ancient town, but you will see that the historical parts of the city have not changed much. And here, of course, summarized uh, the two heroes of Parma, Giuseppe Verdi here in his portrait, and right under the Duchess Maria Luigia. But little by little, walking and walking, not too much actually, we arrive to the baptistry and the cathedral that I'm going to show to you in a second. Okay. Here it is. That's the cathedral, the bell tower, and to the right there is the baptistry. Now, and this is the Piazza del Duomo. Those of you, and right behind the uh, bell tower of the Duomo, there is the bell tower of another church that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. That is the church of uh, San Giovanni Evangelista. It's actually Benedictine Abbey. So just a couple of words about the cathedral. Um, when I say Duomo, I'm sure that many of you familiar with Italy uh, um, think of the Duomo in Milan or the Duomo in Florence with their very, very different yet very ornate facades. Uh, the Milan one is a um, gothic um, Lombardo, very elaborate with spires. The one in Florence is a very eclectic style. It was finished only in the 19th century. Here you have a very, very simple, very austere facade. And it's a sort of a hut uh, style, like a little house, as kids would draw it when they are in elementary school. Uh, and this is pure, beautiful uh, Romanico Lombardo, Rom Lombard Romanesque style, even if it's Emilia Romagna, Parma is in Emilia Romagna, that's uh, this version of the Romanesque style is called Romanico uh, Lombardo. And you see, you recognize the windows um, and the beautiful harmony of shapes and dimensions and the very solemn yet austere entrance uh, that you have on, in the main door of the cathedral. So we are walking now to the main door of the cathedral because it, there is a little something that I want to show you there. Here's what I wanted to show you, but I don't know if you can see it with the sun being against us. We are right underneath the main entrance, the main entryway of the cathedral. And one of the most beloved and recognizable features of this archway is actually right there. I hope you can see it. It's the little pig. These statues on the arch represent the months of the year and the way that the architect and sculptor that realized this cathedral in the 11th century, Benedetto Antelami, uh, was to identify each month of the year with one of the agricultural activities that were common in the countryside around Parma. And come November, it was not a very good day for pigs, uh, because for the day of St. Martin, that's when people used to slaughter their pig. Basically, every family raised a pig, and that would provide meat, lard, and other food that was used throughout the year. So, there you go. I just wanted to show you that the Parmigiani, as devoted as they could be, uh, they wanted to memorialize even the pig on the portal of their cathedral. And here you see much more solemn than the pig being slaughtered, the two leoni stilofori. And in the best tradition, they're 
one in a more reddish marble and the other one in the more whitish marble, the divine and the human being combined together uh, in the cathedral. As I mentioned, we are not entering buildings today, we are just um, seeing them from the outside. So now we're walking towards the baptistry. And I told you that the entire complex was designed and realized by architect Benedetto Antelami. Um, so he's not only uh, responsible for the design of the buildings, but also for its decoration. And one of the magnificent things that are happening during this time when Parma is uh, Italian capital of culture is that the sculptures of the months of the year, the months of the year was a very uh, common theme, recurring themes, the um, high reliefs that are inside the baptistry uh, have been lowered down. So it's going to be a unique chance for those of you who have the fortune to come to Parma to see them uh, up close. Ciao Riccarda, ma grazie che ci sei anche tu a guardarci. Um, so now we are at the main entrance of the cathedral. So think that the, in uh, the ancient times, uh, baptism was administered by the bishop, at baptism of the adults, uh, only by the bishop on the Easter vigil. And the people that had to be baptized entered the opposite side of this uh, door and would walk out processionally with the bishop after they had been baptized and they would walk these little path that we walk and they would enter the cathedral for the first time after their baptism on Easter night. So now, um, this building, I've always seen it uh, when I was a student and before and it's a very impressive building, but I, I have always seen it gray and when they completed the restoration at the end of the 80s, it turned out to be in this beautiful, gorgeous pink. I don't know whether you see it, but here in the arches you see that there is an alternation of the pink and the white that is actually quite remarkable. And in the lunette on top of the door, uh, you see the Virgin Mary seated uh, with the baby Jesus in her lap with the three wise men. There you go, the wise men. There you go. And on the other side, you have the angel telling Joseph to hurry up because Herod is planning something terrible. So uh, he, should, he should leave and they, sh and they should go to Egypt. Right underneath, uh, it's one of my favorite things in Parma, it's basically the entire life of John the Baptist summarized in this uh, strip. It's the, um, um, the ancient... Um, way of a comic book. E vedo le mie compagne di scuola Neva e Anna Maria Caporali e devo assolutamente salutarle. E, um, mi fa piacere che per Anna, anche per Anna questo sia un angolo così bello e memorabile. Um, Neva, come chiamarmi? L'ho scritto ieri che venivo a Parma, dovevi raggiungermi, almeno mi tenevi il telefono, facevo meno figure da scemo. Um, ecco, torniamo, let's go back to the comic strip back there. See on top, it begins with two angels holding towels. And I, I find that such a beautiful human touch that Jesus in the, is in the Jordan River and, and you see that there is a wave that covers uh, the lower body of Jesus and of the Baptist. And you can recognize Jesus because behind his head there is a cross. And then there are three angels ready to dry him up when he comes out of the waters. So in this supremely divine moment of Jesus' baptism, there is somebody who is thinking about him not getting a cold, and as you know, Italian, we can die of a cold in a colpo d'aria. Um, so that's basically right there, the most important moment in the life of John the Baptist, when he gets to baptize Jesus, the Messiah. And if you follow the story on the comic book strip, kind of, um, narrative that you have. There's a beautiful table with a tablecloth. I love the tablecloth all draped on the table. And it's a very important table. It's the table of the king, King Herod. And the king is presiding over the banquet. And next to him there is the queen. And uh, next to the queen there is a young woman with a long tunic carrying a flower. And we know that she is Salome that just danced uh, for King Herod, 
at the instigation of her mother, Erodiade, uh, and after she danced so well in such a sexy and uh, charming way, Hera tells her, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. And uh, because of her mother was constantly called a whore and a harlot by John the Baptist and denounced as an adulterer, as you know, uh, Salome asked for the head of John the Baptist. And there you go. You see the scene of the martyrdom right there. This poor John the Baptist sticking out of that tower and the executioner beheading him. But there is an angel right on top of him. So we are sure of the uh, future of glory that awaits John the Baptist. So it's like the extreme synthesis of the Romanesque style and of the Middle Ages. So whenever people use the adjective Middle Ages in, in a sort of disrespectful way or thinking of insulting somebody, they should think again because it is a product of the Middle Ages. And look at the beauty of these figures. Um, as I mentioned, it's uh, white marble and red marble. And the white marble in the lunette is also painted over. Uh, and this is all uh, stuff that you could only see after the restoration. Before it was all covered in this thick gray patina that didn't allow you to see uh, the colors. And you see there is a beautiful blue in the cloak of the Virgin Mary and also in the sky above. And right in the um, lesene uh, at the, to the sides of the door of the portal, there is the genealogy of Jesus both on the side of uh, here you see on top of it there is King David that is supposed to be an ancestor of Joseph, right, you see? And there is on the other side it arrives, you see it's a genealogical tree, they took the war of the tree quite literally. See there is a tree and you see on top of that tree, the tree is all in, white mar in red marble and on top of the tree though there is the Virgin Mary sculpted in white course being immaculate and having been spared from original sin she's not sculpted like everybody else in red but she's in white um, again a remarkable oops I really need to do some homework with these um, stick otherwise I'm gonna make you feel seasick so we're gonna take a look now at the the next uh, doorway and I love this one too same thing as in the other one you see the central lunette and you can see Jesus in glory uh, he's raising his hands it's not a touchdown he's showing uh, the marks uh, of the wounds uh, of the nails of the cross and to his left there are the angels carrying the cross that from being an instrument of torture and execution has become an instrument of glory because it reminds us of his glory. So it's a judge in Christ after the resurrection. He's seated like a king on a throne and he's surrounded by angels serving him. Uh, right underneath, I love these two. Look at this. These are all these naked people and there are the angels playing the trumpet. And this is the day of judgment. Di esire, di esile. So it's the angels calling the souls uh, to come out of the tombs. And you see literally they are walking out of the tombs and they're lining up waiting for their judgment. And um, as always, as refined as the uh, representation can be, but it's always very easy to understand. It's very easily readable. So on the two lesene, on the two uh, flat columns to the side of the door, there are indicated the ways in which you can get a good judgment, a favorable judgment on Judgment Day. And on this side, there are the works of mercy. Very easy to recognize. So for example, here there is uh, hosting the pilgrims, uh, helping the sick. Look at this beautiful representation of helping the sick. Feeding the hungry could not be clearer than that, and giving water to the thirsty, clothing the naked on top, and visiting the prisoners. And so it's very, again, it's very easy to read, very easy to understand the message. If you do these things, basically, you'll be saved. If you don't, you will not. And this is another beautiful visual representation uh, by Benedetto Antelami. And this is the parable 
uh, of the um, vineyard workers. And I love the fact that in creating this comic strip, um, Telemi decided to use a vineyard branch. You see this beautiful um, details of, of grapes and grape leaves and the very peculiar uh, vin, uh, vine branches uh, all twisted. And you might remember in the parable, uh, the owner of the vineyard calls the workers uh, and then he calls another group of workers and then he decides to pay everybody the same. And the workers that started working in the morning complain because they say, you should have paid us the, uh, more because we worked all day. And you know Jesus' answer. So this is just a little detail, but this is one of the things you can do in Parma, just walking outside, not directly um, uh, going into buildings. So just a little walk, just to give you a sense of what a uh, treasure throughout the city is. Here you see the Bishop's Palace, and so we are slowly leaving. Oh, I promised I would show you the uh, Abbazia of San Giovanni Evangelista, so we return to the Cathedral Square. And right behind it, right behind the cathedral, the building to the right here is the seminary uh, where young people study to become priests for the priesthood. And right behind it, there is There you go. The Abbey of San Giovanni Evangelista. Normally an abbey is something you find in the countryside on top of a hill, um, not in a city. This is a very ancient one and probably they were called, the monks were called by the bishops to establish um, some sort of uh, cathedral school. Um, so that's why you have an abbey so close um, to the cathedral. The abbey is still served by Benedictine monks. There's a beautiful dome inside there too, as there is in the cathedral. Here is the ancient pharmacy of St. John. It's closed and then there is a spezzeria that would be the medieval version of a pharmacy where spices were also medicines. And there you go. The beautiful Renaissance style uh, facade of the Abbey of St. John the Evangelist. And right behind here, there is that maze of small streets that make Parma very fascinating. The synagogue is not too far from here, and many other religious and civic buildings are within walking distance. There aren't many people around today. Uh, normally, uh, Parma is a much more crowded city, but the, um, the COVID pandemic, of course, has changed the habits of all Italians. Parma was also one of the cities that was particularly hit by the pandemic. It seems now that the numbers are good and life is returning back to normal, uh, more or less. And um, now we are gonna walk to the main square. I, sh I showed you before Piazza della Pilotta with the Farnese Palace, the houses the Galleria Nazionale and the Teatro Farnese. I showed you the religious center of Parma with the cathedral, the baptistry and the bell tower. Here it is again, this beautiful blue sky that we are blessed with today. And now I'm gonna show you the civic center of the city. Oh, and I showed you the Teatro Regio, that's the artistic pulsing heart of the city, sort of a secular monument to Giuseppe Verdi, the genius Locci. Thank you, Edward. Thank you. I'm doing very bad with the um, stabilizer, but I promise I will do some work and I will get better at it.
and in a minute we are going to be in Piazza Garibaldi and I'm just going to show you the building that houses City Hall. It's a medieval building. One last look at the bell tower of the cathedral and at the beauty, you see the back entrance of the, of the baptistry where I told you uh, the neophytes, the people that had to be baptized would go through that way, receive baptism inside the baptistry, walk out of the door that I showed you before and get into the cathedral after they were ready to participate fully in the Eucharist. Um, one thing that I didn't mention is that aside from a few buildings, the prevailing color in Parma is yellow and it's a sort of intense, bright and at the same time dark yellow. E il cielo è davvero meraviglioso oggi. And the yellow that you have here, and we'll see many more examples in the Piazza Garibaldi, uh, it's the giallo Parma. It's a very peculiar color of Parma. Um, Maria Luigia was responsible for somehow uniforming uh, the idea. Again, she came from a capital and wanted to have a capital, and providing a unifying color palette is one of the basic tricks if you want to beautify your city to avoid the Arlequin effect and have um, a color palette that is, that is consistent. And now you see Parma today in a beautiful sunny day. It's a glorious day, really. Uh, but normally in the winter, it can be kind of foggy and gray. So the yellow is perfect. It sticks out of the fog and it brings the building buildings uh, outside the fog makes you appreciate them even more. So even in this relatively narrow uh, side alley, you have the buildings that are um, sort of highlighted uh, by this color. And you're going to see more of that in a minute. In a few more minutes, we're going to close our tour. Then I'm going to proceed the rest of my day is going to be... Why don't you go this way? The rest of my day I'm going to go to the uh, celebrations for the opening of a new exhibit that opens today and really marks the restart of all the activities that uh, celebrate Parma Italian Capital of Culture 2020, 2021. Fortunately, the Minister of Culture renewed the status of Parma as Capital of Culture for another year. There was a lot of work that went into it, so it makes sense that the status was extended. And the exhibit I'm going to see is called Ospitale, with an H. And uh, it marks the restoration of the ancient hospital that for decades uh, used to be the State Archive in Parma and has now been turned into a space for a gallery, a space for culture, a museum. Uh, but of course, given what just happened, um, it was also a way to celebrate health workers, emergency workers, and what happened in the Hospital of Parma that was one of, one of the hospitals that responded uh, better to the emergency of the pandemic. So. On one hand, it celebrates this ancient building, building that gave shelter to pilgrims and to sick people. It's being given back to the city as a space for the arts, but at the same time, given the circumstances of the moment, it also um, uh, celebrates the healing work of uh, nurses and doctors. And here you see we are in Piazza Garibaldi, Right, right in front of me, I don't know whether you see it for, uh, it's the Municipio, it's the City Hall. Lots of bikes in Parma. That's one of the parameters on which they base the um, criteria of a livable city, the quality of life, people biking. See, there are very few cars and there are lots of bikes. And that City Hall, you see the the Italian flag and then the flag of Parma, the yellow, of course, and blue of Parma. And then there are the posters 
with the different young people wearing yellow shirts. That's the Giallo Parma we were talking about. There's another example here is the Palazzo del Governatore, a statue to Garibaldi, of course, that is not very original. There is a statue to Garibaldi basically in every Italian city. But here we are now after we have visited the religious center of the city, we are now in the civic center, the political center of the city. And here when we are outside of the sun, it's much better. Again, Verdi, our friend Peppino, uh, everywhere. And now we are gonna walk a little bit more. And this is a poster that uh, celebrates the restoration of another landmark in Parma, is the church of San Francesco del Prato. And I invite you to take a look at the website, uh, sanfrancescodelprato.it. It was restored with great effort to restore it and bring it back also to be used as an art center and especially a theater for the performing arts. And in order to support the restoration of the church, they're selling part of what used to be the jail of Parma. You see there is the, uh, the, the these are pieces that are sort of mementos that are uh, given to donors as a sign, as a token of their participation uh, in the restoration of the Church of San Francisco del Prato. And I love the, um, the slogan they picked for it. It's Liberiamo San Francesco, let's set San Francesco free. And of course, San Francisco refers to the church and to the fact that what used to be a prison is being liberated and it's now being used as a space for culture and the arts. Now, I'm going to show you the, really, I swear, the last two things. One is one of my favorite stores in Parma where I have to confess I've never bought anything. And the other one is a magnificent church that we're going to see in just a second. It's actually the church that I picked in the post to announce this walking tour. Here it is. Okay, let's start with the store and then I'll tell you something about it. So it's a hat store. It's a beautiful hat store. And inside is still, as it used to be, you don't see anything because it's dark inside. Look at these fedoras and ladies' hats. I mean, where do you find something like this? And you also have walking canes of different kinds and in different styles. You have Panama. Again, I love this store, yet I've never bought anything. There is even, even a seeable hat, British style. So if you feel British one day, you can come here and buy it hat and there's a top hat in the gray. Now, this is a little trivia, but what we're here for is this church. And here it's on the, si one, on the side of the church, is the church of Santa Maria della Steccata. It's a church that belongs to a chivalric order, the Constantinian order, an order allegedly established by the Emperor Constantine. And there are some curiosities. You see, it's beautiful Renaissance style with statues right on top. There you go. la sovrintendente Anna sembrerà io sto facendo una diretta di Facebook per la casa italiana e guardate chi incontriamo signori la sovrintendente del teatro Reggio di Parma e siccome è anche molto bella le chiediamo di togliersi la maschera un attimo Blup. assolutamente ci avvicino Anna dici cosa stai preparando per il Festival Verdi Quindi 18 e 20 vado a memoria il Requiem e 
E il requiem dove si farà? Sì, sì tutto il parco locale all'aperto, però di ragioni, dove abbiamo allestito un bellissimo palco. Una platea... Che io vedrò domani, mi sembra che domani c'è un'inaugurazione con il Presidente del Parlamento europeo. Una nuova, diciamo, un rilancio di Parma, capitale italiana della cultura. E poi un terzo titolo, il 25 e 27, non vi fidate delle date, andate a contare. Sul sito festivalverdi.it. Esatto. L'allestimento è bellissimo, è un'occasione per scoprire questo meraviglioso partito che, farà, eh, che, che è stato allestito in modo da avere come sfondo la facciata del Palazzo di Gatti. Fantastico. Dopo che hai vinto per due anni di seguito il miglior festival d'opera al mondo, beh, eh, beh diciamolo, eh, eh, diciamolo, diciamolo, bisogna dirlo, siamo molto contenti. E adesso vengo dal palco della cittadella dove abbiamo presentato il grittissimo partito di Gretti che è un'altra cosa che ti sei inventata tu, che sono eventi verdiani in tutta la città, non nei teatri, scuole, parchi, ospedali, dovunque. Giardini, chiostri e abbiamo anche nel territorio, a Fidenza, a Prosegui, abbiamo eh, inventato un caravan verdiano, che altro non è che una, un progetto di ispirazione, che trae ispirazione dal carro di Teschi e porta in giro nelle piazze una traviata, Mignoli, eh, con un... Da non perdere. È diventato un, un soncoso allestimento del set di traviata e poi abbiamo un risciò che invece mette in scena a rigore. Cioè, è molto alto. Di tutto. di tutto. Già ti hai reinventata di tutto, quest'anno la tua fantasia si è scatenata ancora di più, mi sa che di altri premi, non so se ce n'è da dartene. No, ma io non li prendiamo con Ma se ci sono bisogna darteli. E giuriamo, Anna, giuriamo che non ci eravamo messi d'accordo? Assolutamente no, infatti quando ti ha chiamato ho detto magari non si gira. Con la, ma no, la maschera non l'avevo, sta per questa parola. Sì. Ah. Anna, sono molto contento di averti visto, grazie anche a nome dei nostri ascoltatori, ti stanno facendo i complimenti. Grazie a voi. E, però noi ci vediamo, stasera ci sei e, e poi ci vediamo domani. Io vedrò questa signora molto in questi giorni, sempre rispettando tutte le misure anti-covid, ma... Seguite festivalverdi.it, sta facendo delle cose meravigliose e un grande premio glielo diamo anche noi spiritualmente. Ci vediamo dopo. Grazie, viva Verdi sempre. Ciao. I swear we didn't plan this. Did, a, a, did we speak Italian or English? I don't even remember. Probably Italian. So, but the superintendent, this is the general manager of the Teatro Regio that we just ran into told us the magnificent things they're preparing and we're basically closing our tour where we started. You see the Teatro Regio back there. That's the theater that Anna Meo runs with great energy, determination and passion. And here we are still underneath the church of La Steccata. And I just want to give you a quick look at the facade the main facade, main entrance, but uh, it very often happens in uh, Renaissance buildings, the entire building is a masterpiece. See, there are basically no straight lines, so it's not your traditional uh, Renaissance architecture, but it's beautiful and it's full of harmony. A couple of uh, trivia, I'm the king of trivia, if you don't know it by now. Um, inside here there is the tomb of the second husband of Maria Luigia, the beloved Duchess of Parma, Piacenza and Gostalla. He was an Austrian officer uh, that was half blinded in battle and was crippled in battle and the Emperor sent him to check on his daughter because yes she was his daughter but she remained the wife of Napoleon. They were very much afraid that she could be used by the Napoleonic party to restore a Napoleonic regime and so the Emperor of Austria took the little boy, the son of Maria Luigi Napoleon, uh, brought him to Vienna where he underwent a serious process of uh, brainwashing. They made him basically forget French, he could only speak German, and he lost his title of King of Rome and he became one of the dozens uh, Austrian Archdukes and Maria Luigi was here in Parma. And as luck would have it, it seems almost like the plot of an opera. The man who was sent to spy on her and to keep her in check uh, Neiper became her lover. They fell mad in love. They had a son that was not recognized and lived uh, here in the countryside and she visited him regularly but he called her 
La Signora, he didn't know. There is a beautiful book by Francesca San Vitale that tells this story. Uh, it's called Il Figlio dell'Impero. It's, it's an amazing book that I strongly suggest you to read that tells the whole story of this uh, uh, woman, a uh, remarkable woman again. Uh, and uh, so inside here there is the tomb of Niper, the morganatic husband of Maria Teresa of Austria. And interesting, you see on the, on the entryway, there is the Constantinian cross, this is the symbol of the chivalric order that owns the church, uh, the order founded by uh, Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor. And inside there is a museum, and among, it's one of the uh, strangest things ever uh, that you can find in there, is nothing less but the shirt that Louis XVI, the King of France, wore to the guillotine when he was beheaded. I had no idea about that. I just found out and I had to share this piece of trivia with you. And we are finishing our tour of the city. Maria Luigia, yes, sorry. Did you say Maria Teresa? No, that's Maria Luigia. Thank you, Anna Maria Verga. And right here we finish our tour. I, I spoke, what, for 40 minutes with no interruption. Uh, you see the, two, the other two signs that the superintendent mentions the Macbeth and the Mesa da Verdi, the Requiem. Here is the sign of the best festival Verdi all over the place. Check it out if you can travel to Italy, if you can travel to Parma, try not to miss it, try to come. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous, uh, it's a fantastic day. I'm going to continue my day with the inauguration of uh, Ospitale, the exhibit dedicated to the hospital. It was a pleasure walking with you and for you, I did this for all the friends that tell me that they are very sad and sorry that they cannot come to Italy uh, this summer. Can you hear something? Yes, you can. Because they are rehearsing or singing or something. And with this, I just wanted to... Okay. And this is all for today. And uh, our next live, hopefully is gonna be a little better from a technical point of view, is gonna be from Mantova, and that's gonna be this coming Monday. And in Mantova, we're gonna have a little walking tour of the city. And after the tour is over, we're gonna meet with the organizers of the Festival Letteratura, that is the most uh, prestigious literary festival in Italy. And we're gonna hear from them what they have in store, what they're working on, uh, what to expect from the festival. This year the festival is going to have a big uh, virtual component. So there are a lot of things that you can follow and listen to via their uh, web channel and radio that they have established. So uh, don't miss next Monday at 5 p.m. live from Mantova, Walk with the Director. Ciao, grazie.